Dave Ward and Friends is proud to be supported by Sonic Automotive. My family has driven a Sonic Automotive car for 12 years, and I know they're the best in the business. Whether it's purchasing a new or pre-owned car or servicing your current vehicle, let Sonic Automotive be your trusted car guides. Start looking for your new car at soniccars.com. Well, Houston, we've been through a lot together. We started in radio 60 years ago. It was such a great gig, my father cautioned me against going into this thing called television, but we did it, and we had a pretty good run. We even went from black and white to color TV, then to high definition. I keep hearing about streaming and digital, and well, it's a chance to reconnect with my friends and viewers and share stories from our times together throughout these last six decades. What do you say, Houston? Let's do this. How are we doing? Did we, did we, look, look at this big old setup here. How are we doing? Good to start with you. I'm doing wonderful. How you doing, partner? It's so good to see you. Good Thank see you, you so much for doing this. Thanks for asking, buddy. Well, golly. Um, are we getting video on this? Uh -huh. yes, yes, sir. Now, listen, I've been around some great ones. This one here is a, a pillar in our town right here. I can't wait to tell him a few things about watching him when I was little. And I say little when I was in high school. Bless your heart. Him and, him and Marvin Zindler. Oh, I couldn't, yeah. couldn't wait to hear them both. Hello friends, I'm Dave Ward and welcome to Dave Ward and Friends. This is a series of casual conversations with people I've gotten to know and meet over my 60 years of broadcasting radio and television news in Houston. Today is a red letter day, my friends. I'm here with a legend, legendary baseball pitcher Roger Clemens. Roger, how are you, sir? It's great, partner. I'm glad to see you always. And like I said, you make me think of wonderful things when I see you here in Houston and uh, uh, just keeping up with you and watching you over the years and uh, hearing your voice. It just it, it just sounds like home. So I'm glad you had the opportunity to come here and and uh, and interview me. Well, bless your heart. Thank you for allowing us to come out here and interview. I know you were born in Ohio. Absolutely. Well, what got you to Texas? So I was born in Dayton, Ohio. Mm -hmm. um, after my father passed away when I was nine, Dave, um, my mom grabbed six of us and came uh, and went south. My, mm -hmm. my oldest brother uh, was uh, in the Vietnam War. He was stationed down this way. My number, uh, oh, there's six children and I'm the youngest boy. So my, my middle brother, um, he had work here also. So it was pretty cool that mom uh, had the guts and the wherewithal to pick up and come down here and look for a job to raise six of us. And uh, that's exactly what she did. I mean, she found, uh, she knew I loved the game of baseball and I was fortunate to, uh, we found a, a town home over by Springwoods High School. And there was a fantastic coach there named Charlie Mariana. He's since passed, but coach was uh, a fantastic baseball person but better teacher of the game. And that's kind of how my career, as far as the baseball side of it, Dave, happened. You know, I was lucky. I got to play for three wonderful coaches, but they were better men and better teachers of the game. My second coach, you, you'll recognize name, Wayne Graham, yeah. who was at Rice University. Well, he was at San Jacinto before I went to Texas. So I went one year to San Jack. Then they had the opportunity to go to the University of Texas and to play under another wonderful man, Cliff Gustafson. So mm -hmm. that's kind of how that happened, how we my, really my father passing away. Um, I had to grow up at a young age. I had, uh, you know, I had two strong willed women who raised me, my mother and my grandmother. Uh -huh. And uh, they were they were set in their ways and they, they taught me what a work ethic really is. Hmm. You also played football and basketball. What, how did you get to baseball for 
I love football. I think I took a little bit of my football mentality to the mound when I was uh -huh. pitching over my 24 years. I was very, very intense playing, but that's, again, the way I was brought up, that you really take your job to heart and, um, and give it everything you had. I remember my grandmother saying, boy, if you're, gonna, if you're a ditch digger, be the best ditch digger you can be. Out ditch, out dig everybody, and uh, that's the kind of way our family operated. But I love football. I love basketball. I think basketball because my my brother was really good basketball player, and he's really mm -hmm. the one that kind of influenced me into the sports world uh, in general. Um, but um, when it came down to it, I just I just loved the game of baseball. Uh huh. I tried to play football when I was in junior high school, out in Cisco, Texas, near Abilene. And the only time I carried the ball, I fumbled it. <laughs> I wasn't very good at playing football. But in your career, baseball is what got you to college to get a higher education, right? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Not until um, really a little bit. I got noticed in high school a little bit. I didn't throw hard. I hadn't matured. I graduated when I was 17 years old. I was the third best pitcher on the team. There were two guys that were a little bit older, more mature, and they threw hard for high school at that time. And then uh, uh, once I went to San Jack, o over that summer, I grew two inches to 6'4", and uh, my work ethics even got better. And Coach Graham tells the story um, uh, wonderfully about, uh, you know, why he was cutting the grass on the field. Everybody had gone home, and he and I were the two out on the field doing some work. But... Uh, uh, you know, uh, there was no doubt about it that I, our family wasn't going to afford uh, to pay my way through school. Once I had the opportunity to go to a major university like the University of Texas, and my mother knew it, she wanted me to further my education, and uh, that's how it all happened via scholarship. Uh -huh. But you went to Texas University and set some kind of records there, didn't you? Texas was fun, Dave. I mean, when I got there, it was still a little intimidating. Uh, you know, 48, 49,000 students being, you know, at, at that time, now you realize you're only two hours away from home, but it still felt like you were in another state sometimes. Um, and I, I joined a bunch of great uh, baseball players and, again, a great coach, a legendary coach in Coach Cliff Gustafson. And he, was, he became the winningest all-time coach in NCAA history. Um, and again, it was a situation where I was really blossoming and um, we ended up going to the College World Series in 82 and lost uh, late in the finals. And then uh, we were able to, fortunate enough to go back the very next year and I beat Alabama in the final game of the College World Series. And I was drafted in the first round by the Boston Red Sox. So uh -huh. that's kind of how my journey started. You know, I was fortunate that I was, I loved history. I didn't know everything about the Red Sox. My mother loved writing some poems, and she wrote me a little poem about Fenway Park uh -huh. and uh, what was going on in Boston. And um, uh, just super lucky that I was able to go play for a team with so rich in tradition in the history and even the, the Fenway Park. I mean, uh, once you think about it, I actually stood right on the same field where Babe Ruth Ted Williams and Carl Yaskrimski played. I played right on the same field that those guys, those men played bo uh, before me. Uh -huh. So just really, just really cool uh, historic moments. Wonderful. You had a legendary workouts and a pregame routine. Can you describe that to us? Yeah, I mean, it was, again, it was something that I was fortunate that as far as my pitching mechanics, um, none, none of my pitching coaches on the way up, my mechanics were pretty good. I had, I had, the opportunity didn't have the video we in the early 80s like we have now mm -hmm. on so many pictures but i had eight by tens you know i had to cover sports illustrateds that i would look at a tom siever or a nolan ryan and see how they were using their legs and everything that they were doing to get that ball from the pitcher's mound to home plate at, at, a, at a rapid pace and uh, so i just looked at their legs their mechanics a little bit and i took it and i really uh, was fortunate because uh, I was never had any uh, really major injuries uh, throughout my 24 years of throwing a baseball at that high rate of speed. But, uh, um, you know, it was, again, it was, uh, the, the work habits came from my, the habits came from my mother and my grandmother. I, uh -huh. I watched my mom work three jobs here in Houston to get me a, I mean, my sister reminds me all the time, mom would save food, food stamps so I could have a really cool red glove when I was little. Mm -hmm. And so, man, I mean, I had the best glove. I thought, I, I thought we were rich, you know, and I uh, had a good pair, a nice pair of cleats. 
And, uh, but I watched her, I, even in high school, I helped her, you know, stock uh, uh, in the third job. She was at a convenience store and I would help her there when I could. And um, so, but she did everything. And right, you know, now, now with my four boys, Dave, and the two grandbabies, uh, you know, I look at it, I said, how did my mom ever do it with the six of us? I have, yeah. I mean, back then, I mean, I just, you know, I just am so thankful all the time, uh, you know, when I think about what she instilled in me, the hard work, the pride, with the 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 teams that I played for, I wore them on my chair. The, the the in Boston, uh, Toronto, New York, and then obviously what a blessing for me to come home and have the opportunity to play for my hometown Astros mm -hmm. and stay at my own place here and yeah. drive 20 minutes down to Minute Maid and yeah. we got to the World Series and we had a crazy 18 inning game. I had to pitch in it was an unbelievable game that I had to pitch in and. Uh, so just, just so many really cool memories. Uh, I, and when I think about those, I think all my teammates. I had some wonderful teammates. I had teammates that paid attention to detail. I was very thorough. I was more than a student of the game. So all that, all that kind of factored in is, you know, like I tell the youngsters that come over here and work with my oldest son, Kobe, who does lessons from seven-year-olds to college guys. We had the Astros. Some of the Astro pitchers will come over here and throw on this, in this facility we're at right now. And... Uh, you know, we just tell them, I mean, you can't teach confidence. You cannot teach that. We give them life lessons. Uh, I love to get the kids that get cut from the high school teams that are pretty upset and crying, get them over here, try and fix them up a little bit and get their mechanics right or their hitting right. Go try out again. Don't, don't, don't make that coach keep you on the team. Be so good that he can't let you go. And uh, so those are the life lessons that we have it. And the same thing with the workouts. All the work's done behind the scenes. I think that the, the I just was with some guys earlier today, this morning, uh, um, not too far from here, and we talked about that, about playing long toss and keeping care of your core work and things of that nature. And uh, that's how you have longevity. And, um, and thank God for ice. My, my body agrees to ice, thank goodness. And <laughs> when I need to ice my arm and my elbow, it's, uh, it works out pretty good. Your fastball, how fast in miles per hour could you throw a ball? So being a power pitcher, I'm not a power thrower, Dave, and there's a big difference between a thrower and a pitcher. And most, a lot of the relievers are throwers because they're really, um, like I said, if you took the lid off a blender, they're coming at you with arms, legs, coming at you a number of different ways. But uh, a power pitcher, I'm going to sustain my speed through seven, eight, nine innings, hopefully. And, um, but I pitched probably between 94 and 97 miles an hour. I threw over 100 a number of times when I really wanted to cut a ball loose to really throw on hard, but I never, I never sustained that pitch because when you, the harder you throw uh, and to generate the ball with that type of speed, you're going to make mistakes in the middle of the plate. And these guys are professional hitters that I'm facing. They're, I, I tell people uh, a little cliche that um, big league hitters can put wood on a bullet. That's how good they are. Right. So you have to, um, for a pitcher, uh, location, and you have to have three things, location, movement, and velocity, in, in that order. You have to be able to locate. You have to have some good movement. So while I'm throwing you a baseball and you think it's there, by the time it gets to you, it's not there. It's moving a little bit, you yeah. know. And then uh, your velocity is really the last thing that you need if you know how to pitch. Uh -huh. I remember Jeff Bagwell. <laughs> and his very unorthodox batting stance, instead of having his feet together and then stepping into it, he had his feet wide apart, and he could still knock that ball. He could knock the cover off. Baggy's a good friend, and I, and I have asked him a few times to come over and watch not only my boys hit, but a few others to give them tips. And uh -huh. Baggy is a... Uh, Baggy could have played anywhere in, in the country. He's got that great mindset as a professional player, um, a toughness to him. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, but his stance it was unique, like you said. He spread out and he bent down, mm -hmm. um, and he had some torque. He had some great really? hands, fast hands, and some torque, where he could get some elevation to get the ball out of the ballpark. Those were the days we had the killer bees, Bagwell, Biggio, and Berkman. I think that, it was. exactly right. That was so much fun yeah. again for Dave for me to come home and play with those guys and yeah. get. To, I mean, they were legend, legendary players here at home and get the opportunity to play with them and go to the World Series. And it was fun for me because then I, I got to see them up close and personal, how they went about their daily work to get ready for a game. When Before, I watched them all the time because they were my hometown team, but I, uh -huh. I never really knew them that great. Tell me, how did you get the nickname Rocket? 
Great question. So 1986, I came out of the gate, and uh, I think it was my fourth start against Seattle Mariners, April 29th, uh, 1986 in Boston. I struck out 20 batters to set a major league record. It's never been done before. And I struck out 20 guys, and uh, after the game, uh, my teammate Bruce Hurst gave me the nickname The Rocket. Huh. And I think it had to be something, of course, with Houston and NASA and all that all together. And, uh, but he gave me the nickname The Rocket, and it stuck. And I answered probably to The Rocket when kids or people holler my name more than Roger. So <laughs> <laughs> that's how it hit, and it stuck. And uh, it's, it's fun to hear the, the younger guys and that call me by my nickname. 20 strikeouts in how many innings? Nine inning games. Single, and you yeah. pitched the whole nine innings? Yep, and I tease people, Dave, 10 years later, I repeated the feat and did it again in Detroit. So I struck out 20 batters twice. Wow. Yep. Has anyone else ever done that? They have, actually. There's, uh, I think, three other uh, guys that have done it, and they're actually talking about doing a, a special, a, an hour special show on uh, uh, Kane 20. And they're, they're going to talk to, to all of us about uh, how it came about. At Sonic Automotive, we went from happy guests to happy owners. I felt right at home during the whole process. If my home only had a bigger garage for all those cars. Sonic Automotive has 13 stores in the Houston area, providing you 10 vehicle brands for new sales and services. Visit SonicCars.com to find your new car. Dave Ward and Friends is proud to be supported by Sonic Automotive. Let Sonic Automotive be your trusted car, guys. Visit SonicCars.com to find the location near you. You were the first player at University of Texas to have your jersey number retired, right? I believe so. I believe so. What was your jersey number at 21. I wore 21 uh -huh. and 22 my whole career. It kind of was uh -huh. a number in my family, and it just happened that way. When I came out of Texas after the Red Sox drafted me, I have to tip my hat to the clubhouse manager in Boston. He must have been paying attention after I got drafted because once I got to Boston, hanging up my locker was number 21. Thank goodness there wasn't <laughs> a, a star player, a veteran player that already had it. So I was able to wear 21, and uh, uh, I wore 21 in Boston and Toronto. And then in New York, I wore 22. And then when I came home here to Houston, I wore 22 also. Uh, you played for four different major league ball clubs, Boston, then Toronto Blue Jays, then the New York Yankees. Correct. And then you ended your career as a Houston Astro, right? Yeah, I tried to retire a couple times. It didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Which of those four teams do you remember most fondly? Well, Boston's always going to have the, the uh, big spot in my heart because they, they took a chance on me. They drafted me when I was 20, 21 years old uh, and um, gave me an opportunity to chase my dreams. It was something I wanted to do. I, I wanted to get to the major leagues as fast as I could because I wanted to face Reggie Jackson. And uh, Reggie was a the, the a hitting hero of mine that I watched in the 70s. You know, he hit the three famous home runs in the World Series in like, I think, 1977. And uh, now that Reggie and I have become friends, I tell the story all the time. He gets on me because he would always say that I, when the, his team would face me, I would throw in miles per hour, 93 miles an hour, 93 miles an hour, 93. And then when Reggie would get introduced and step in the box, my first couple of pitches of Reggie were like 98, 98, 98. He goes, why do you always throw faster to me? And I go, because you're Reggie Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you warrant that. So, but, uh, so Red Sox are great. Again, Dave, the history off yeah. the chart. Babe Ruth started there. I've got, I've, I'm tied with Cy Young and, and in, I think, wins and shutouts with the Red Sox, actually tied with him. Uh -huh. And uh, everybody's like, come back and play another year and get a, you know, see if you can beat his records. And I said, no, I think it's really cool since I hold all these Cy Young awards that we are actually equal with one another. And uh, mm -hmm. so it's pretty cool to see your name right next to a guy named Cy Young, really? who they named the, the best pitching award after. And then same thing with the Yankees. I played in old Yankee Stadium. I didn't play in the new one. And I tease people that the old Yankee Stadium is, it has ghosts running around in there. I mean, we, we, there were some of the wins that we pulled off, the comeback wins, Dave, in that stadium were, you would not believe it. I mean, I, we don't have, there's not enough time of day for me to tell you how crazy some of our wins were. We were losing and, and some of them were in the, on the biggest stage in the World Series. But there, I have some very famous 
photos in the house and uh, and the boys, since I played long enough, they realize that when they walk by it, you see Lou Gehrig giving his farewell speech. And they're like, Dad, you stood right there where Lou Gehrig and Babe Ruth and Mickey Mantle and DiMaggio. And I go, yeah, it's pretty cool, man. So I love my time in Toronto. Uh, Mr. Beeston, the owner at the time, came down there and courted me, wanted me to come north and said they were going to rebuild that team. And then, uh, and then I decided to retire after the Yankees. I had a, a, I think it was 2003, I was shutting it down and had about 100 fans outside the gate there and, uh, and wanted me to come back and pitch. Uh, um, uh, I think it was 2004, Andy came home and signed. he's a hometown boy and Andy came down and signed and then mentioned something about possibly me coming out of retirement and it just caught fire and I was like, oh gosh, because I would think I was like 43, 44 years old at the time. So I was like, I was worried about breaking down and, and embarrassing myself out there. So. But it worked out. I got I got it ready, and I, I got to tell you, it was the 2004, 2005, 2006 were wonderful years here. We had a baseball town like no other. We, everybody was uh, just into it. All the fans made it fun for all of us as players, and uh, just so special. Yes, it was truly. You won seven Cy Young awards, I did. right? Absolutely. Well, back in those days, the pitcher also had to uh, be a batter. How was your batting average? Well, everybody listening or watching this is going to be laughing because they get on me. But uh, I actually, I think I hit 228 one year. And uh, I always tell them I was a really good bunner. But uh, <laughs> so I think really after high school, a little bit, we got to take BP a little bit in college. And then uh, I didn't hit, you know, because being in Boston, you're in the American League. So the pitchers uh -huh. didn't hit then. Uh, when we got close to the playoffs, the pitching coach would have us come early to the stadium in October when the playoffs were starting mm -hmm. and have us bunt and we'd take a few swings. So we never really got the practice. But like you alluded to, when I came home and I signed on to pitch here at home with the Astros, we were in the National League at the time. So we did uh -huh. have to hit. And not until uh, Drayton, Drayton McLean sold the team. Uh, to Jim Crane, that's when they flipped into the American League where you didn't uh -huh. have to do it. So, but I, I, uh, I, I got a few hits to hold my own. The, the mm -hmm. boys, my, all my boys are hitters, and uh, so they would get on me if, if I would swing and miss too much. <laughs> <laughs> but you were a good bunter. I was a good bunter. That kept me in some games late. You know, if I, if I showed the manager, uh, Jimmy Williams, I was with Jimmy Williams uh, here in Houston. Jimmy is probably one of the if not the top baseball man that I've ever had an opportunity to talk to, uh -huh. just through and through a great baseball man and a great baseball mind. And uh, he took me out into the batting cages in Kissimmee in spring training. And here I am with my day with my credentials that I've, you know, I've got all these Cy Young awards at that time. You know, I've got possibly 300, you know, 300 plus wins. And he said, if you'll get here early, I'll take me to the cage. I want to make sure that you can get some bunts down because if I, I can trust you getting a bunt down in the fifth, sixth inning, I can leave you in uh, for pitching uh, if I know that you can handle the bat a little bit and get a bunt down for yourself, give us a chance to win. Mm -hmm. And he was exactly right. I mean, I really, we, we met in the cage 7, 7.30 in the morning before the workouts even started in Kissimmee. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, he was making sure I was getting that bunt down. You obviously enjoyed playing for your hometown team, the Houston Astros. Absolutely. Was that your favorite? I mean, that was your last team that you played for. It, it was. It kind of tied it all the way back. You know, my very first All-Star game in 1986, I was with the Red Sox, and I was having a wonderful year, and I got picked to start the game in the Astrodome. Uh -huh. So I started the All-Star game here, and I actually got to, I lived in Katy, Texas at the time, so I got to sleep in my own, and I always thought about how wonderful that would be to drive, to have, you know, stay in your home base and be able to drive uh -huh. 20 minutes all the time. But uh, I had wonderful places in the other cities. We just never, we never just set up shop there. We always kept the kids here uh, at a home base for their uh, structure, and we had some great great uh, schools here too so yeah. we we kind of worked out of Houston and that's where I'd come home in the off season and watch you <laughs> <laughs> well, good a man of high intelligence here well I can remember when they were building the Astrodome and the team played in a temporary park outside and they were called the Colt 45s and due to a dispute with the 
Colt 45 Firearm Company or the Colt 45 Malt Liquor Company, I think the Firearm Company, they had to change the name. And I remember when Roy Huffines called everybody together, the reporters, to announce the change of the name of the team. And he said, they will not, from now on be known as the Houston Astros, short for astronauts. And we all thought, Astros, what kind of <laughs> name is that? But you know, as you know, it stuck. It did. And there for a while on television, when they would lose a game or have a series of losses, I'd come on and I'd say, well, they're, uh, our team is now known as the Strohs, which tells you what they lost. <laughs> and I saw you pitch and down that, there yeah. in Minute Maid. I had some good uh, ones here. I pitched, I pitched, I probably, I tell people at my advanced age, I think I was 43, 44, and 45 in those years. Uh-huh. Uh, and pitching in that, definitely with the Crawford boxes being friendly hitting. Yeah. Uh, it was three, three of my better years at my advanced age for sure. Uh huh. And I actually won a Cy Young here with the guys too. They, so that was pretty special. They were in Minute Maid what, when, you're, when you pitched here, Absolutely. not in the Astrodome. No, I got to pitch in the Astrodome in the All-Star Game uh-huh. in 86. Uh-huh. And then uh, I actually was the uh, opposing first pitcher, uh, opposing pitcher with the Yankees when they opened up Minute Maid. We had an exhibition game here uh-huh. right before the season. Of them. The Yankees played the Astros, and uh-huh. uh, we were here as the Yankees. So uh-huh. that was good, too, yeah. I remember when they first opened the Astrodome, for baseball, uh, that yeah, first Yankees game, were there, I think, too. I think, yes, they? the Yankees were the first team to play in the Astrodome. So they had trouble seeing the ball. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to bring up. They had clear uh, panels panels on the roof so they could grow grass. <laughs> They'd hit a ball up into those panels, and the fielders could not see it. I mean, they were out there going like this, and the ball would fall five, <laughs> yeah, ten feet they couldn't away see from it. That led them to paint over the panels in the roof of the dome, which then led to the creation of the artificial turf, which they called AstroTurf. It really changed the whole aspect of the game in the Astrodome when they finally painted it. 100%, 100%. But I think the move to Minute Maid Park was a good one. It's a beautiful stadium in a great spot down there. Do you miss not playing the game anymore? I don't, I've had that question just a few times. So yeah, just uh, it used to be when I always say my yogiism, my yogi bearism, uh, that I have to unretire to retire because I'm still <laughs> we're, we're going pretty like you. you. You're not slowing down. So <laughs> so uh, oh so and I can't go without mentioning this. My oldest brother, like I told you, served in Vietnam. I had five or six uncles serve, mm-hmm. and just so the viewers know and that you know, probably the coolest thing that I've ever had the opportunity to do. I was the pitcher, I was pitching, I was supposed to be the pitcher the night of 9 of September 11th in New York. That was my game. Uh. And I was in my place in New York City when I was woken by a friend of mine on the same top level of the building that something happened at World Trade Center. And I was a New York Yankee pitching for what is a milestone for a starting pitcher, 20 wins. And uh, you're trying to get 20 wins in a season is, is like a, a watermark for a starter. Mm-hmm. And I was playing against my old team, my former team, the Red Sox. So it was going to be a big evening that night. And um, so we all know what happened. Our world changed as we know it. But uh, my agents went to high school with General Myers, who was our four-star general at the time. And uh, General Myers asked me to go to the Middle East to see our men and women. Uh And uh, so the Pentagon had printed up a bunch of photos and baseballs that I signed to take over there. We took um, the comedian Drew Carey with us to tell a few jokes. But... Dave, I got to tell you, seven days saw probably 16, 17,000 of our men and women. I was taken aback about how young everybody was over there, but how enthusiastic they were so fired up to be able to serve our country and make somebody like myself feel protected when I go out there on that mound in front of all those people in in our country. So uh, I tip my hat, if anybody's watching or listening out there into you, I tip my hat to Mm -hmm. Uh, all of our military men and women. That's yeah. it goes without saying. That game on 9/11 between the Red Sox and the Yankees. Did they cancel the game? It was canceled. I actually yeah. ended up driving. They shut down all the airports, as everybody knew, yeah. for a couple of weeks. So Deb and I ended up driving about. Uh, I think it took us nonstop about 23 hours from New York to get back here. Uh-huh. And brothers and sisters were all n- nervous and edgy because they knew 
Uh, my place was probably, if I had to guess, 15 to 18 miles from the World Trade Center. And we could see what was going on the second half of the, uh, what the second part of everything was happening up yeah. there. And uh, uh, just to see the stress. When we ended up playing, we went to Comiskey to play the White Sox. And uh -huh. this, the stress on everybody's eyes, especially when we got back to New York, Mr. Steinbrenner brought back a bu bunch of firefighters, police officers, mm -hmm. and uh, families that lost their loved ones in that building. And uh, it's just heavy heart. I had to go out and pitch. It was actually the game that you might recall, and if you see the video, you'll, um, President Bush went out to the mound to throw out the pitch. He had a mm -hmm. bulletproof vest on. I was warming up in the bullpen at that time, mm -hmm. and I stopped warming up so I could watch him throw the pitch because Yankee Stadium, we had you know, 55 plus thousand people in the stands and it the stadium lit up like a Christmas tree but the president went out there and threw a perfect strike in front of the world mm -hmm. and uh, uh, that was a very emotional game for me it was game three of the World Series that year in 2001 and uh, but Mr. Steinbrenner brought back over three or four hundred police officers mm -hmm. firefighters and families that lost loved ones and he lined our our tunnel underneath the stadium to bring them out on the field and when you made eye contact with those people that lost their children and their loved ones, it was just, uh, it was really hard to, you know, I mean, you could just see the, the, uh, uh, how much heaviness in their heart they had. So, uh, again, I tip my hat to everyone. Again, these are people that when people were running downstairs, these guys were running upstairs yeah, to yeah. save people. So it just that tells must you, have been a very emotional experience. It was it was unbelievable. It was something that New York's never seen before, and mm -hmm. the rally cry that that uh, came from it was uh, outstanding. Yeah. Well, speaking of the emotional, uh, this podcast is going to air on opening day for the Houston Astros here in Houston. Love that. What are your thoughts about this coming season? Uh, the, the Astros have uh, great leadership. Uh, I think they have um, uh, uh, Lance McCullers is being a, you know, I, I love that kid and he's coming off his uh, elbow showing that he's healthy. He's going to have to step up with Grinky. Those two are going to have to be big time horses for us. It always goes for me, it goes right to pitching and defense, Dave. Mm -hmm. um, but they're going to be fun. They've got a young uh, core of great players still and uh, I would expect nothing less for them to get in the playoffs and then see where they go from there. Once you get in the playoffs, then it's every who's hot at that time and yeah. really has a lot of confidence. Like we talked earlier in this segment, uh, you can't teach confidence and that's something that you've got to have. So uh, they're winners. Those guys are winners. They know how to play. Mr. Crane came in here and uh, he's a winner. He does things right behind the scenes and, uh -huh. uh, and gets things done. And so, uh, you know, I, I just I just love it that they're competitive. It makes it fun for everybody here to root them on. And like you said, after the season, if you get to the playoffs, that's like a whole brand new season in itself. Whole 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 different whole deal. You got to win got to win eleven games before uh -huh. you lose. Uh, you know, what is it that that many? So, serious. yeah, I've often wondered how Abner Doubleday came up with the game of baseball. <laughs> the and he calculated the distance between the bases is what, 90 feet exactly. I don't remember the distance between the pitching mound and home plate. 60 feet, six inches. 60 right there. feet, yep. six That's inches. What you see. And he decided that the game should be nine innings long. Why not eight or 10? They or said they'd have a break after four, but you're exactly right. I, I, I've, I have uh, had a. Um, uh, school of thought with many players and my boys on that same subject. Could you imagine back in the early 19, early eight, late 1800s? Yeah. So they set the bases down. D double, they mm -hmm. set the bases down, and there were only 80 feet instead of 90, and everybody was uh, safe. He's uh, like, this is no fun. We can't get anybody out. I didn't move know that. It back, move it back to 95 feet. Uh -huh. So they put it back to 90. No, I'm just saying this is probably what happened. I don't know this. Oh, okay. I don't, like you said, I wonder how they got it to be 90 feet. Yeah. So after everybody was safe at 80 feet, don't you think he probably picked that piece of concrete up yep. or whatever they're using for a base, walked it to 95 feet, and then everybody was out, out. and he kept itching it back, <laughs> itching it back, boom, 90 feet. This is where it needs to be because sometimes you're safe, sometimes you're out. Could that you imagine? Well and, and the same thing with the pitcher's mound. Maybe it was 50 feet at one uh -huh. time, and I was striking everybody out way back there in the 1900s. <laughs> they said, this is no fun. I had because, to yeah, so they probably had to start working it back a little bit. I want to back up here a minute. I want to ask you about your charity 
Foundation. Absolutely. Uh, Roger Clements Foundation, and it's for, to help children? Yep, at-risk kids. And well, uh, we've had it since 1991, Dave, right here uh, at home. We, uh, we, we deal with at-risk children. Uh, we've gone outside the box a few times, got a few really um, uh, 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 letters pulling at their heartstrings that were outside that, but um, uh, for the most part, at-risk children. You know, my wife, Laura Ward, is the executive director of Houston Children's Charity, which helps disabled and disadvantaged children and has for years, I think, You've done some events with Absolutely. her. Absolutely. Lars, she's been great uh, talking with Deb. My wife, Debbie, and I have helped out and, and uh, been at many of the events. And in turn, they've uh, helped us out uh, on some different auction items that, you know, I do a couple of really fun golf outings and baseball clinics in here. Or I throw base. Sometimes I'll throw an hour worth of batting practice uh, um, uh, with some businessmen and uh, get them a little Mexican food and margaritas. And then after we're done here, we send them down to the Astros game to a suite and they love the package. So we do, we do some fun experience, experience, experience packages that we do now. So uh, they seem to love that, but absolutely. We've, we've had some fun with Laura and she's, she's uh, been great over the years. Well, you're doing awfully good, my friend. I appreciate you it, You really buddy. are. Always good to see you. Well, thank you. I appreciate you. you asking. Well, my friend, Thank you from the bottom of my heart for welcoming me into your home You're and for this beautiful conversation. And thank you for tuning in here to Dave Ward and Friends. Buckle your seat belts, friends. You won't believe the VIP perks that Sonic Automotive is offering you. $500 cash toward a new vehicle, $250 cash toward a pre-owned vehicle, 25% off any repair or service, and more. Thank you, Sonic Automotive, for being the official sponsor of the Dave Ward and Friends podcast. To see the VIP perks they're offering my friends, visit soniccars.com. Look at that handle. That's called an axe handle. It doesn't look like an axe. You know, you know when you swing an axe? So when they grip it down here, it helps this bone, because sometimes that thing will hit and dig into the bone. Huh. So a guy decided he'd do an axe handle. I guess it produces the handle, but that's solid, that's solid maple. Look at you, you know exactly how the whole thing's bad to work. Well, you look like, I don't know. You look like Ty Cobb. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I tell you what, you're swinging that thing, though. That's a heavy bag. Isn't it really? No, that was good. You were swinging. It was good. I mean, it was good.